<coughs> All right, so this is the best part of the treat. We have been keeping the best to the last. Making a living versus a living a life. A half an hour session with Guru Charandas. In fact, <coughs> there have been two arguments about this. One is, Omar Khayyam says that you have to live in the moment. While there is a German philosophy for Freud, which says that it's the intense anticipation of the pleasure which matters. Whether it is living in the moment or living for the moment which matters. Let's find out in the session, making a living versus a living a life. Over to you, sir. Thank you. So I realize you've had a whole day and you must be tired and ready to go home. So I'll try to finish it in 20 minutes and not try to take the full 30 minutes that have been allotted to me. Let's begin by playing a thought game. You've just come from a doctor's office and he has told you, you have three months to live. Three months. What will you do? How will you live those three months? Well, you're certainly, I mean, think about it, actually. Think about how you would want to live your last three months. Close your eyes. Take a few seconds. I'll, I'll wait. Take a few minutes. Take, take, a, take a 30 seconds. And uh, ask yourself, how would you like to live? Well, <clears throat> you won't do an MBA, for sure. Even executive, <laughs> you won't, even an executive MBA, you won't do that. So how will your life be different from what you are doing today? And be honest. Will you finally take a few risks in life? Will you fall in love with somebody or declare your love to somebody who you've loved all your life but never had the daring to say so? There was a French newspaper in the 1920s which did this, they did a survey and they asked people how would they live their lives? And people came up with lots of answers. But the most honest answers were, the last three months will be religion or sex. That would be, was the, was the <coughs> conclusion. Well, the purpose of this thought game is basically to drive home the point that we all want to live an examined life. But the choices we make are generally to postpone this moment. We always, you know, as Yudhishthir says in the Ramayana, I mean in the Mahabharat, Yudhishthir says at one point about the, in answering to the Yaksha, uh, as Yudhishthir says, the most remarkable thing about human beings is that they see people dying around them, but they never think they will die. So, we keep postponing and then we wake up in middle age. Some of us have a midlife crisis and then we ask ourselves, is this what life was all about? Some point in our 40s or whatever. The problem, however, begins in childhood. We come home as children and our mothers say, did you get good marks? 
how much did you were you first in class no one asks us at that point what do you really like to do what is your nobody teaches us to cultivate a passion very few of us are mozarts mozart at the age of 3 knew that he was a music genius and by the age of 5 he had written of his first symphony so for most of us discovering our passion is a trial and error business we and so it's our duty as parents as teachers to help our children to discover a passion in life we are when we are in college we are encouraged to take useful courses engineering law medicine business and it's understandable because until 91 and even now we still suffer from middle class insecurities and that's where parents are always worried oh my god what will what will my boy do when he grows up or what will my daughter do and so we study to make a living rather than study to make a life and this talk is about the difference between making a living and making a life so we pass out from college and then we get a job and then we start making a career and in our careers we get promoted we start climbing ladders at work we get married have children get a house then a car then maybe a bigger house then maybe a bigger car and then we repeat this process with our young again we ask the young how did you do in school did you start did you and so it's a cycle that goes on dysfunctionally because you gain then as i said in your 40s or 50s you suddenly ask yourself is this what life was all about and this is what happened to me i was at the world headquarters of our company in america and i had a big job and i was earning a lot of money and i was not yet 50 but every morning i would i was head of global strategy for procter and gamble and every morning i'd come to work and i would ask i, I would look at the market shares of our major brands vix oil of ole tide detergent pampers whisper i mean pantene shampoo you know all these nice brands but then i said how long can an adult come to work in the morning and look at the market share of these products there's surely there's a big world outside and uh <coughs> shouldn't i taste that world do something in that world instead of just continuing uh, this life i mean i was in a golden cage uh and so i went home 
early that day and I told my wife that this is, this is how I was feeling and she said, cha-cha-cha, you're only, you're having a midlife crisis, forget it, you'll wake up tomorrow, have a shower, you'll be fine. But that uh, next morning it didn't work. And uh, I was started to, I s began moping around again. And, and so I came home one day and to my, fa to my wife and I said, look, this is it, no more. We are going back home. And uh, I went and told my boss, First, I had to convince my wife that uh, she said, look, you're, f you're f not even 50 and uh, how are we going to make our living? We've got many years to live. So I sat down, explained, did some math sums that we had savings, I had stock options, etc. And if we lived sensibly, we could live well. I told her, now your standard of living won't go up, but let's tr I'll try to see that it doesn't go down for the rest of our lives. And also we were lucky. Our children had done college and they were uh, sort of on their way. And uh, so our responsibilities were somewhat less. And so then, uh, we did the sums, she was a good sport. She agreed that, okay, if we live well, we had a house already, we could come back to in India and live. And then she said, do you know what you want to do? And I said, sure. I've been, a, I was a weekend writer. My friends played golf, but I wrote. So I'd written a novel in my 30s. I'd written plays in my 20s. And so that's what I thought I would do. And so she agreed and that's, the rest is history. So for the last 22 years, I've been back home, been a full-time writer. Uh, in between I was tempted, I was, uh, I felt guilty that I should participate, not just write. I got a column in the Times of India on Sunday, so I became a commentator. Uh, but I did feel guilty that I was not participating somehow in politics or making things happen. So a friend of mine knew Sonia Gandhi. She was out of power at that time, in, during Vajpayee's days and she invited me to come and chat and very quickly she realized that this guy uh, it will be useless in the Congress party. I, my views were just too reformist. She was not a reformer. Manmohan Singh was a reformer but Manmohan Singh's big failure was that he did not convince her that market-based reforms is India's future. So then I met Advani and Advani also didn't find any use for me. So I came stayed on as a writer. But <clears throat> the point here is that the decision to make this change was a realization which my wife also realized that we not only have a duty to others, we all know that. We are reminded every day about our duty to others. But we also have a duty to ourselves, a duty to realize our potential. The Greeks understood this when they talked about eudaimonia. And so I think therefore in a sense, um, so if we go backward, in childhood is when the right time to start is. As I said, you encourage the child and when you are young,
to get the right attitude. I talked earlier about attitudes versus skills, that you can, when you recruit people, recruit for attitude. You can always train people in skills. So I think that's where the trial and error is with a child, to find, to cultivate the passion in your children or grandchildren. <coughs> and when they do go to college or they are in school, that's when we have to encourage them to not do things only that are useful, not economics, not engineering, but if they find some passion. And this is where, this is where I think I was lucky that I had a very unusual undergraduate education. If I could wish one thing for us in India, for every Indian boy and girl when they finish school, and that is that they get a chance to experience what I did, which is an experience of a, of a liberal education in arts and sciences at the undergraduate stage. And this is what the American, what they call the core curriculum in an American liberal college is. I was lucky I got a scholarship to Harvard at a time when very few people had even heard of Harvard in India. And so I took, from 1959 to 1963, I was an undergraduate at Harvard. Now my father was an engineer. And he, I said, of course, in deference to my father, I should be an engineer. But the very first day I arrived, they say you're in the wrong college. You should go down the river. There's a college called MIT. That's where you learn engineering. And then I said, oh God. And, but quickly, in the very first year, I tasted the liberal education. I took a course in chemistry. I took a course in literature, Greek tragedy. And in this way, I came home in the summer. And for the first time in my life, I saw poverty in India. You have to go away from India to see the poverty of India. And then I said, oh, but I must study economics if, I, if we're going to do something about poverty. And then I had an economics teacher like a man called Jan John Kenneth Galbraith, big name. But he was such a boring <laughs> teacher. Frankly, he'd fall asleep on his notes. So he turned me off economics. And then I found beauty. And I said, oh my God, I should become an architect. Beautiful buildings of the Bauhaus and modern buildings. So I enrolled in a class in architecture. Then in the next semester, there was a wonderful course in history, a very inspiring teacher. And I finally understood world history. And so every semester, I kept changing my classes. Now, you, the American education allows you to do that. They don't even expect you to give your major until your junior year, third year. And by this time, then I discovered Sanskrit. We had a greatest Sanskrit scholar at Harvard. And it was only because I read Sanskrit with Daniel Ingalls that I was able to write the book called The Difficulty of Being Good. So this is what I urge all of you. This is a literary festival. And a literary festival means don't try to reinvent the wheel. Read books. There's go Google. I would, if I were you, I would Google 100 great books or call the great books program. There are 100 books you have to read. Some colleges in America, only on four years, you spend your time reading these 100 books. There's the usual classics, Plato, Aristotle, Marx, Freud, and the great writers. And what they teach you in these great books, and you can do it, 
everybody can do it at any time. It's really, it's really this whole business of learning from others. If you can't find your passion within you, learn how others found it, which is, seems to be a very sensible advice. So what have I learned in the past 20 years? Very little, I'm afraid. One is that idea that Krishna talk, taught in the Gita, the idea of nishkam karma. Do, the, do your work without caring who gets the credit for it. That's basically the way to put it. Krishna doesn't put it like that, but that's the way. That this is what he calls desireless action, nishphala, nishkama karma. But the way to test this, when you're really enjoying your work, do test it. You know, over lunch with Suresh and Raghu and all, we were talking about what people will, if people don't have to work in the future, there won't be jobs anymore, how will we live our lives? And the idea basically is that it's an inside job. Happiness is an inside job. And so it's your attitude. And so if you really like what you're doing, it's like I go from my bedroom to my bath, uh, to my bedroom to my study at 6 a.m. in the morning. And from 6 to 12, I don't look at email. I don't answer phones. I don't read the newspaper. I don't take a walk. I only write because I'm on, everything else puts me on somebody else's agenda and I want to be on my agenda. And so this thought really is when you're absorbed, time gets distorted. You say, every morning I'll say, oh my God, it's already 12. I thought it was about 10, 10 o'clock, 10.30. For one and a half hours, I had lost that time. Time gets distorted. And so you'll find, that's what athletes call being in the zone. When people asked Tendulkar when he was approaching his double century, you know that great double century he hit towards the end of his career, people asked him and he said, you know, I wasn't even there. People said, how did it feel approaching your double century? He said, no, the ball had become so big by then and the bat had become so big that the bat had to hit the ball and I wasn't there. And so it is this whole process when work is not work, you are absorbed. And this is one of the lessons that I have learned to live in the moment, to live in the present, that life happens when you're making plans you, for, you lose life. So don't devalue your moment. And therefore, we are, you know, we are all human beings. We are projected forward. We are planning. Suresh is thinking he's going to get home. What is he? He's going to have a drink when he gets home. What is he going to do? So we are all thinking like that. We are not actually there in the moment and so on. So I would say that... that um, I think my time's running out. I promised you I would go. I still have a little more to talk about, but in the interest of good time, I think I've made my point that uh, essentially what I have talked about um, really is the basic thought that if you have three months to live, you could become a Zen monk and spend five years in five, those three months in stillness. You could, you could look for leisure, but then how will you fill that leisure? You got to know. You can be moved by curiosity, a love for excellence, then sometimes I find that I will end up spending a whole hour 
over three sentences, getting them just right. And time just goes without realizing it. Very unproductive, you would say. Anyway, each of us has to decide. And so I wish you luck. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. What a fabulous closure. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Can we give him one more round of good round of applause, please? Thank you. Making a life versus making a living. Thank you very much. <clears throat> On behalf of V. Raghunathan, Benedict Parmanand, Shankar P., Shiny Anthony, and Sangeet Vargis, Thank you very much for being here. We really thoroughly enjoyed every minute of the session and we enjoyed every minute of being with you people. Thank you very much. I especially thank the interns who have come from NMIMS and the audience especially. Thank you very much. See you again soon. Good night. <laughs>